So, my watch switched to 1518. Welcome back to the second part of Perform Europe of our launch event. Welcome all those here with me in the Zoom space on little pictures that uh, have become so familiar with all of us. Welcome also, also those on the live stream that are following us until we break out in little groups in about 45 minutes. Please feel invited to follow our session and uh, keep using the Q&A part for big parts of this meeting. Just some technical uh, information for those in our Zoom space. Please, as you all know, don't forget to mute and unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself for now. Could you also, if you can, even if you drink your coffee and have your cookie in your hand and have some crumbles on your cheek, preferably switch on your camera so that we can see each other. We know each other. We are family, aren't we? Use the chat in the Zoom space for comments, for questions, for thoughts. And last but not least, uh, we record this meeting for research purposes in plenary, but also later on in the different little breakout groups. Without further ado, let's start with me in this plenary space. And I would love to have her right to me or left to me on this fantastic Zoom space is Elena from ITM. You know her all. Um, I couldn't feel safer uh, to have Elena next to me. So Elena, can you help me to introduce further this part of our launch event? Thank you, Catherine. I hope I can meet your expectations about safety. I will do my best. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, you have seen my face already today. So this part of the event, we are going to have a series of conversations in order to uh, map and understand better some of the key issues, factors, and elements which come to our mind when we are thinking about future schemes for distribution and touring in Europe. And I'm very happy to start straight away with our um, five speakers. Um, each of them is an expert in a specific topic which is relevant for our thematic of sustainable and inclusive touring. And um, I would like to start our conversation with Anita Dovare. Anita is director of PEARL, Performing Arts Employers Association League Europe, uh, European Federation of Music and Live Performance Organizations. Hello, Anita, welcome. Hello. Hello, Elena. How, How are, are you? you? <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Very nice to see your face here. Yeah. Uh, so, Anita, let's jump to the content straight away. Could you please help us to depict and understand what are the current um, economic and social legal conditions uh, in which touring is happening today in Europe? Before I start answering that question, first of all, congratulations with the launch. I mean, it was a beautiful launch. Unfortunately, I had a breakdown on the, of the internet in the middle of the speech of Eleanor Bauer, and I was a bit panicking for now, so let's hope everything works well. But uh, that's what you get with digital, so hopefully with digital performances that doesn't happen. Um, so thanks for the question. I know we don't have much time to cover um, a complex set of topics and questions. The current uh, socio-economic and legal conditions, well, um, we know in what status we are. To first start with uh, the pandemic that is happening, um, we have limitations uh, to traveling, we have limitations to performing, um, if at all performing on stage is uh, possible, um, if we have opportunities, we are put often in a quarantine, uh, we need to do tests, um, but I think that is not particularly what you were looking for as an answer. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, we are living in this uh, current set of uh, time and um, one way or the other we have to deal with it and it's also impacting a lot of people who work with third country nationals. Um, where it is very difficult to find nowadays flights, just that already physically, and uh, to deal with visa if, if they are coming. So, so that on a practical note in the current uh, context. Now, if we talk about current uh, economic or in general on the socioeconomic and legal conditions in which touring happens um, in the European Union, well, um, we have the principles on which the European Union is based. It's the free movement of people, of goods and services. And we have uh, what is called a European internal market in which we can move around. 
Um, so, so that already said means that we, we are somewhat in, in a position where, where there are, in one way, you could say there are no obstacles. And we have also a Europe which has, um, um, and the current commission has very strong aims on uh, further developing the social Europe. Um, it develops a lot of um, rules and conditions to make sure that um, everybody, well, the governments, <laughs> first of all, but then, of course, everybody who is working um, and touring, um, not particularly for us, but for everybody, uh, that it applies that um, you, you obey by those rules. Um, and the number of rules are growing. <laughs> so they're good, they protect. They're there to ensure that um, uh, workers, people who are um, uh, working in different countries, that they are protected uh, rightfully. But with that also comes quite a lot of administrative burdens. Everybody who has organized a tour knows um, that it is complex. Um, there are many uh, things to take into consideration, whether it is obtaining an, uh, a portable document, the so-called A1 document for social security, or whether it is you have to deal with, with tax, um, uh, re um, being able to reclaim taxes, um, other things. Um, so we, we have to deal with many, many aspects, but all for the good. I mean, that's, that's what Europe um, stands behind. Um, so, at the same time, when you think of digital touring, you would think it's easy, but at the same time, we know one of the big laws that was discussed two years ago, the, the copyright law, um, is also about how you deal with the protection of the rights of, of the artists, the performers, the creators. So, there are many things you need to take into consideration once you are getting into an environment which is international and um, that we have to adhere to. I mean, it's only normal that when we set up an, uh, um, an, uh, yeah, uh, uh, such a wonderful uh, project, um, not to Thank you, Anita, with this uh, nice word, wonderful. I think I have to jump in and cut you a little bit. Yeah. So you were mentioning this a lot of these issues and conditions, and I really like this um, administrative burdens uh, reference, but also positive side of, of, the, of the whole uh, spectrum. Could you maybe answer my last question for now, which is a little bit um, uh, kind of a hybrid? How do these all these conditions, and maybe especially the challenging ones, but if you want, you can focus on the positive ones, actually affect the sustainable sustainable practices in touring, and also how do they? Um, undermine or maybe stimulate uh, inclusivity of the touring landscape in, uh, in Europe? Hmm. To start with the last, I think, well, in principle, Europe is, is very much for inclusivity. I mean, there are also anti-discrimination laws, so you, 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 you by law have to be inclusive or you, people can take you to court. Um, but as it was said much better than I can explain uh, in the opening part, it's still a challenge huh, in the practice of what we do. Now for um, sustainability, I think that's even more a challenge. How are we going to deal with it in a touring perspective? Um, there you can get confronting um, discussions. Um, on the one hand, wanting to be sustainable. On the other hand, you have people who for example, would like to be with their family. So how do you deal, for example, with the concept of slow touring? Um, when people think of, oh, I have a family at home, I want to see my kids. And on the other hand, you're trying to develop another notion of, of, uh, of, of touring. Um, so I think that there are kind of, there, there will come interesting discussions of, of uh, in what you will do and how you're going to balance. And I liked the word very much in, in uh, the, the use of the word balance. How can you balance to come to an environment where everybody feels, um, yeah, respected? Um, because it's not because you say, for me, it's a priority to be back in one day because I want to see my, my kids. Um, they shouldn't be punished versus the people who say, well, 
we should have another model of touring. We should not take the, the, the plane, but take the train. And it takes your, your tour three days longer, for example. I had a look before uh, joining here and I thought, yeah, when you are in a remote area, uh, coming whatever from, from say Romania or so, um, it's quite different to get here by train than if you have the luxury talking about, I'm in Brussels based and it only takes me three, four hours to, to get to the horizon of, of capital cities. So also that is, is and that was also discussed in the iPortunus um, uh, project very much. So, so it is a challenge uh, to deal with, with questions on how to reach those goals. And I think the first thing is about setting those goals um what, how to to perceive that but also to talk with the audiences because on the one hand you have of course people who are traveling but you also have the audiences that you're talking to and uh, there are many aspects there so i think yeah um um in that that remit there, there are many kind of factors and um, elements that that will have to be unraveled and the the one size fits all will not exist it will be always tailor-made absolutely absolutely and and uh, yeah thank you for this reference to balance because indeed inclusivity and sustainability are such a great values but they are not necessarily uh, feeding each other as well. So sometimes we need to find a balance between them as well. So Anita, thank you very much. And I just would like to say to everyone that we are watched uh, live uh, on Facebook by 189 people and here were 75 participants. So let's continue this consolidation of Perform Europe um, and see uh, into gaps which exist in cultural mobility. And I would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Marie Fall, who is the president of On The Move Cultural Mobility Network. Hello, Marie. Very nice to see you. Hi, hi, Elena. How are hi, you? Everyone. Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, I want to join also Anita on congratulating all of you uh, and the consortium but also the performing arts sector to pull this off and move forward with developing cultural mobility in practice, um, being in a digital form or in a physical form in the coming 18 months. This is you, really yeah. thrilling. <laughs> But tell us, please, Marie, as, um, as um, On The Move has a lot of expertise in mobility, based on your expertise, could you please share with us your insights about the current imbalances and gaps which exist in um, cultural mobility in Europe? Yes. Um, so if uh, I look back at the um, IPOTN study, um, the operational study that was done in March 2019 in the framework of another mobility funding um, um, pilot project from the European Commission. And at the time, this was commissioned by um, the consortium of Goethe Institute, Institut Francais, Isoliatia, and that Art Colony 2 on the move. So we made this study to see um, what mobility funding existed in Europe at that time and, and given last year, this hasn't changed drastically, I would say, um, the observation of 2019. So we can see three form of imbalances as far as um, the mobility of persons is concerned, which is very relevant when we come to the mobility um, within the performing arts. So the first um, inequality I want to mention is the inequality in terms of access to funding. Uh, in the 2000 regular calls that we um, studied, uh, there are, those calls are in the hands of about five to eight countries, mostly in Western Europe, uh, including France, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Austria, Spain, and the UK, for instance. Um, those grants cover, the, the, the grants that are provided um, cover uh, travel, but often only partially, and, and all the related costs are often only partially covered. So a lot of performing arts professionals still have to put in money, and if they come from certain regions of Europe, they will not be able to access this uh, funding. And additionally to that, it's very irregular um, open calls and a lot of project-based calls that make um, the very short-term uh, uh, time frame to apply very difficult for the sustainability of the sector itself when it comes to accessing those funds. So that's the first issue, the access to funding. The second one is an inequality between what the funders are providing and what the need of the sector are. So in this study, we, we also analyzed um, 
what the sector wanted in every discipline. So we covered visual arts, architecture, and so on, but we also covered performing arts. And um, it was clear that the performing arts sector wanted more, um, had more needs for research, for exploration, for networking. And I was very glad to hear Pia mention that those were a priority for Perform Europe because that was a need and that's not often seen as what is being funded. Um, also, as was mentioned also by Anita um, in this issue of sustainability and, and durability, um, this question that a lot of the performing arts practitioners were saying that they, are, they have the need for very short mobility, a three to 15 days mobility because of the reality of the sector. And um, that was very difficult to, to, to match with the offer of funders. Finally, um, and this is linking to what Anita was saying also very um, uh, quickly before me, on the inequality of access to information. There are a lot of burdens, uh, which are very positive, obviously, as, as Anita said, but it's very difficult for independent artists, for independent companies to uh, really be able to uh, have the capacity to answer and fully benefit of the existing opportunities. Thank you, Marie. And my, my next question to you was, how did COVID-19 impact those imbalances? But I think you already said that nothing really changed since 2019. And probably it's too early to say, but I assume that everything became, all these disbalances became even bigger. What's it's, your opinion? It, it did become bigger. Um, so of course there was a neg negative impact in the sense that um, uh, mobility wasn't possible. Um, the funding opportunity have also shifted more to uh, a national base, national focus because of the limitation to mobility, because of the health requirement and, and the, the sanitary requirements. So there is this potential shift that we see already happening um, that a lot of funding is more nationally focused, more um, uh, less for the cross-border touring. And um, this is quite important to note because on the move on the move website has been extremely viewed during the pandemic time and there is a huge competition towards the existing calls so this um it's important to be reminded that for many artists and cultural professionals mobility the need for mobility and the need for cross-border touring comes from an economical reality and an economic necessity so um it is a way to make a living and um it is important to see how we, how artists and cultural professionals will be able to sustain themselves after the pandemic has ended. That being said, of course, it also boosted the digital practices. Um, a lot of funding for, for, for digital uh, practices has been made available. So a lot of international funding moved to digital, which created somehow online as a new country in the calls that were presented. So that was quite interesting, but the imbalances I mentioned before were still there in the sense that the paid opportunity were coming from the same countries. So there is a replication of the same inequality and I think it's important to know about it, to be, to be conscious of it, to make sure that opportunities continue to be um, as widely accessible as possible, especially if we consider the territory of creative Europe countries. Um, a point also I want to mention on online practices is that it cannot be a, a, a solution that fits everything. We are all uh, longing for physical contact, for physical expression, for, for, for cross-border touring in practice. Um, and we often have this question when it comes to sustainability and durability, is online the green alternative that we were all looking for? And I think a lot of what has been tried out over the last year and also before, because online is not a new practice that just um, appeared last year, is that we need to avoid polarization and really consider all the options that are in front of us. And finally, to end on a brighter side of, um, we had a pandemic indeed, but when talking with mobility funders, and this is what, what we do also within, with the members of On The Move, um, there is, uh, not only an attitude to answer the crisis with support to hybrid formats, with support to um, accompany, accompany the, the practitioner through the digital shift, but also readiness to rethink and revamp mobility funding schemes 
to the need of artists and professionals to enhance the dialogue with those professionals. So I think there is really a momentum with Perform Europe that we see right now, definitely, but also to continue thinking, and, and this links to the topic we will um, talk about in a minute, to rethink on what are the needs for access, what are the needs for parents, how can we really make uh, cross-border mobility inclusive and sustainable, and, and this is really what I want to leave the performing art, performing, uh, perform Europe, sorry, team with that this is really um, the challenges that are there and the opportunity that you're creating to, to really look into this. Thank you, Marie. This was quite inspiring, actually. I expected to hear like uh, more dry um, information, but we also got inspired from you. Thank you so much. And now in the, in the second part of our conversations panel, we are going to hear about three topics which we find very relevant for Perform Europe. And the topics are access of disabled artists, um, to touring, uh, digitalization of distribution, and rural touring. And just, it has to be said, we're aware that there are many more other topics which are very important for sustainable and inclusive touring, such as ecological sustainability, gender balance, uh, ethnic diversity, and so on. And all these topics will be definitely tackled uh, within Perform Europe. But we wanted now to hear about issues which we found are perhaps a bit under discussed in the current setting. So let's jump to um, the topic of access for disabled artists to, to the touring opportunities. And I'm very happy to welcome Ben Evans here. Ben Evans is um, head of arts and disability at British Council and also project director of uh, the EU funded project Europe Beyond Access. And um, Ben is really an expert in this um, issue and I would like to hear straight away from you Ben. Um, so one of the ambitions of the project uh, Europe Beyond Access was to help um, disabled artists to internationalize their careers. From your experience and observations how do you think disabled artists experience the current European touring market and how did your project uh, try to approach touring in a new way? And welcome. Thanks. Thank you, and thanks for um, Perform Europe Consortium for inviting our contribution. I think, firstly, I just wanted to say it's it's really important to know that there is a remarkable generation of disabled theatre and dance artists across Europe, and I would encourage everyone to go and explore. And another thing to say is this work is not niche. Um, it's being commissioned and presented by leading arts organisations, uh, organizations that understand and respect the innovative practices and the new approaches to the art forms. So disabled artists are not only making work for disability arts festivals, that's an old and outdated way of thinking. But touring in particular is hugely problematic. Accessible buildings, accommodation, transport for artists are not standard. And I think cultural managers assume that disabled artists and arts professionals simply will not be part of their touring programs unless they develop a special or um, dedicated program. So our, our we've already heard of compared with international contracts and carnets and transport and language barriers and especially compared with COVID contingency plans, accessible touring is not complicated for our professional arts managers in Europe. It just needs to be on the agenda and it needs to be on the agenda from the start and it needs to be planned and budgeted in from project design. So I think that's a key takeaway for us. Um, it's not difficult, it just needs thinking about. Um, but I think um, I'm just gonna move on to the next part of what I wanted to say, which is that there is a huge opportunity here, I think that perform Europe offers with the, a new touring program. Um, it can no longer be assumed that disabled artists and arts professionals will not be hoping, hoping to benefit from European touring opportunities. Um, and I think funding that touring not only needs to follow the direction of the cultural sector, but also at times it needs to lead the way. So I think some things in the perfect world are not negotiable. So we need to include budget lines for access costs. Um, you know, the, the things that we, that others take for granted, personal assistance, sign language, and uh, additional transport costs. We need to see those budget lines in the, in the application so that everyone applying has thought about it. 
and we need to understand that some artists work best in slightly different timescales. And we need to create protected budgets to cover access costs and, and not include this in the budget ceiling for artistic work, because currently disabled artists are penalized because they're taking access seriously. So some a huge opportunity, but also some challenges which we'd like to share with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. I cannot agree more. And um, how has the digitalization of the lockdown period taught us to um, maybe offer new ways for disabled artists or were there anything to learn from? Lots to learn from, I think. Um, I think the sad irony of COVID is that for many, many years, cultural institutions have insisted on a specific way of working, one which has to be face to face, eight to 10 hour rehearsal days, a particular touring schedule, um, not taking work online. And this is despite years of disabled cultural professionals and audiences asking for online access to conferences, to digital exchange and hybrid events or online learning. And then suddenly, in the space of a few weeks or months, our sector found the creativity to respond to a new situation. Of course we did. But what we learned was change is possible. And as um, as we just heard, the reality that we all are desperate to meet and work together again. Um, despite that, we can never go back to the ways that we worked before. So we've got to acknowledge that the people you want to reach, some of them may have challenges traveling to a conference or a production. And along with our environmental responsibility, we have to take responsibility for not re-marginalizing those people. And I just one last thing, and I promise I'll end here, but, but just to say, as we develop those digital tools, we must reflect on how those tools are accessed by professionals and audiences with access needs. So this is a practical consideration, but in my view, a political challenge to us all, how to make our digital offer accessible to visually impaired or deaf artists or audiences. How do we develop those tools without creating more barriers at a time we should be tearing them down in the arts? Thank you, Ben. I think what you're saying is super important and continuing um, our discussion about the digital. And before I invite our next panelist, Karen Toftegaard, who is an expert in the digitalization of distribution, I would like to bring up another digital aspect. We are watched by 225 people um, on Facebook. And well, here you can see that we are 76. So that just, you know. C Hello, Karen. Um, welcome. And uh, very nice to see you. Karen you. is the CEO of, of Wildtopia, um, which um, produces the digital first live performing arts festival relocation. And Karen is also a cultural entrepreneur and producer of Copenhagen Stage. Hello, Karen. Hello, thank you, Elena. I just have to, to add, I'm not on the international producer at Copenhagen State. There are several producers at this festival. So not to take all the credit. Um, thank you very much for this invitation to share my perspective. I, I would say that when the COVID-19 uh, started, I mean, it was kind of gave me the opportunity to combine two of my professional interests, like the festivals. I really like festivals, been uh, contributing to a ton of them or a lot of them at least. And then also I've been working a lot in the, with digital communication. So in some way that kind of just, whoa, did uh, this, this uh, combination. And, 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 and uh, I, I, I decided also very much to look at the opportunities. Yeah. And I think that what I hear when people are talking about digital versus uh, uh, in person, it's 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 very much also about is it the comp is it is is the digital compromise or is it a, a creative opportunity? And what's important here is that it all this was the response to this very much depends on the eyes who's looking at it. And so we all have a, a choice to make there. Do we do we want to see it as a compromise or do we want to see it as an a digital or as a creative opportunity? And I definitely want to embrace the part of the latter one. And I think that uh, when we look at the uh, landscape, I think it's a pleasure to see uh, that the festivals, they are embracing the hybrid formats. And, uh, and I mean, uh, also, uh, I mean, th this is a a actually a very important for a touring aspect because 
when the ones who are presenting the work, they are embracing the hybrid uh, aspects, then we should also, and, uh, and there is also, and it makes, it makes a lot of sense because uh, theater is uh, very much there. It's all, all the, all in all time, it has been there where the people are, where the audiences are. It's so connected with the audiences. And at some point people have been talking about, okay, we have the digital state, or is it, is it real theater when it happens digitally? And I mean, it, this is just another stage. It's just another stage with an audience and it's our job to find out what are the opportunities in this. And I think that uh, I would like to, to, to ask, some, instead of giving, um, talking a lot of things, I'm just going to raise some questions uh, regarding what I've been seeing and recognizing in the works, uh, the digital works that I've been seeing and, and, and collaborating with. So what does inter uh, digital intimacy look like? Please try and reflect that. What does digital in intimacy look like? Because it's actually, uh, uh, there are works uh, working on that. And there is also, how do you enhance this in-person uh, work uh, with, with a digital presence? There was this uh, Dutch company uh, who made Swan Lake where they combined, they did a hybrid uh, work there and they combined the digital audiences uh, selections with what happened in the in-person, uh, the physical um, uh, space. And the, the that's where we're, the, the two different, uh, the, both the digital uh, audiences and the in-person audiences, they were kind of intertwined there. So you can work with that. And there is also participatory theater in person that is going to be very much affected by the COVID-19 because uh, personal distance, that is a, a thing in our mindset that has been challenged a lot. And so participa participatory theater in, 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 in person might change a lot but maybe we could then uh, make the participatory theater digitally because then you're not uh, afraid of the body fluids or whatever uh, which you are afraid of in the in-person uh, aspect and then also there's something about this immersive theater that's another thing how can you actually in uh, interact with people when you are uh, more more um, feeling when you want to create safe uh, environments uh, in person. So that's also something that you can actually develop in the in the digital sphere. So it's very much about looking at what, uh, like in every aspect of, uh, of doing creation, what kind of creative opportunities do we have here digitally and like diving into that. I think that's incredibly interesting. Yeah, thank you. One, Jen, with one thing also, this thing about the audiences, yeah, they have a they can, there's actually a possibility online to have a co-experience with somebody who is on the other side of the world uh, or is in another side of the country and so on this co-experience for audiences uh, without traveling i think that's also a very ex important aspect especially for like the participatory and immersive uh, theater aspects mm -hmm. thank you for that um karen um yeah you and your um in your answer you kind of uh, brought up um, what unique values digital actually can bring to, to the performing arts because we are used and, and you hear it all over again that uh, digital um, brings like takes away the main asset of, of performing arts is liveliness. So thank you for bringing up this kind of inspiring aspects. But maybe if we go back to the values of Perform Europe briefly, how do you think um, the digital world can enhance inclusivity and sustainability of touring, of distribution. You are mute. Sorry, I would like to uh, begin to address a myth uh, because there has, I've been hearing that several times, this thing about that two hours of Netflix streamed every single day in a year that pollutes as much as or affects the environmental um, uh, situations just as much as flying 385 uh, in uh, 84 uh, kilometers. And if you know that the flying distance between Copenhagen and Amsterdam, that is almost that, I mean, and that's just one way, then I think there is something about, yes, that working digitally is not solving all the sustainable uh, issues. And it's not like you're like totally 100% sustainable when you're working digitally. However, I mean, uh, you can show a lot of live performing arts uh, uh, all, a lot of times uh, during the year uh, and not at all coming uh, any way close to fly in the, fly, the flight um, uh, or the amount of flying uh, around the world for doing the same thing in person because yes these uh, two hours each day of streaming that's I mean that's that's only 
only a flight between Copenhagen and Amsterdam. So I, I'm just thinking that is something that we should also think about. So there is actually an actual fact in this thing that you can uh, work internationally uh, using the uh, the digital aspects and you can also the, the, the audiences don't have to travel as much so there's definitely a thing about not traveling as much as earlier on and then I think there's also something about the resources you can you can reframe you can reuse you can reimagine uh, the works that you're doing and you can actually bring it to more audiences but you could also uh, make it more sustain sustainable in the production uh, production wise so you you can you can present it to in 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 Denmark, in in Brussels, in in in, in uh, South Africa, and uh, at the same time, but you don't have to like uh, uh, send your uh, tour, uh, your scenography uh, across uh, uh, over the ocean or anything. You don't have to like uh, send away all your scenography. You can actually navigate in another way and be more careful of all the all, all the traveling and transportation, all that around which we are normally dealing with when it comes to to touring. And uh, I just think I just also want to appreciate the fact that there are several digital festivals also arising. I'm I'm working on one who's called Relocation, and I just uh, put a, a, a link there in the um, in the in the chat. Uh, it's supported by the Danish Arts Foundation. Thank you so much. Um, but then we have Shed, for example, Shedinburgh. Shedinburgh was a thing that that arose in the, in um, because of Edinburgh Festival Fringe not happening last year, and then the Shedinburgh actually appeared as a smaller digital festival. And I think that was very interesting to see, and that's also a thing about digital touring. So I think. Like, just like the festivals and venues are starting to think in 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 person events and in digital events, then the touring agents and the touring and the companies they should also just try and start try and start thinking in digital and in person. It's two different things. It's two different programs, but it's just like bringing more <laughs> different kinds of um, uh, performing artworks to the to the audiences and to the venues. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I really sense your positive energy and I hope that every <laughs> participant does. It was really great, your uh, positive um, approach to, to the digital. And now let's um, jump to some completely different worlds, maybe not, but uh, another topic, uh, the rural touring. And I'm happy to welcome here Ralph Lister, our fifth speaker. Welcome, Ralph, and thank you for being with us. Ralph Lister is the chief executive of Take Art, a UK-based organization, and um, this organization is also leading the EU-funded project SPARS, supporting and promoting arts and rural settlements of Europe. Hello, Ralph, and my first question to you would be, please share with us uh, some of your insights and experiences and knowledge on how does rural touring and specifically the touring models developed in your project inspire environmentally sustainable practices? Yeah, thanks, Elena. Uh, and also, as with the others, congratulations on the, on the project. I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, experiment. Um, rural touring, for those that, you don't, that don't know, brings professional performing arts companies into rural areas. And it's achieved by working with rural communities. And uh, importantly, there is no compromise over the artistic quality of the experience. Sparse is a, a three-year Creative Europe funded project and it uses existing rural touring models in the UK and also in Sweden as the basis for creating new networks in Estonia, Italy, Lithuania and Romania. We recently increased the network and it also has partners now in Sweden, Norway, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Spain and Poland. So to answer your question, the beauty of rural touring is, it, is that it brings the artists to the audience, rather than asking the audience to travel in their cars, their vehicles, to the nearest to the nearest theatre in a town or city in their own region. In the UK, Julie's Bicycle, an organisation who advises the Arts Council of England uh, on the environmental matters, they undertook a rural touring carbon assessment analysis. It showed that the rural touring model reduces emissions by a third in relation to artists and audience travel when compared with a single show at a town-based theatre. In addition, our sparse evaluation has shown that nearly 50% of our audience lives less than five kilometres from the village hall. 
People often walk to the performance and I have an experience one winter in the UK where because of the snow, the roads were completely blocked and the whole audience walked to the village hall. I, I saw them coming down the road. It was a really, really beautiful experience. Um, in addition, linking rural touring agencies together can optimise touring opportunities. Collaboration between seven agencies in the southwest of England enabled a tour by a Spanish circus company in the spring of 2019. And that resulted in 11 performances, several workshops in 11 rural venues over two and a half weeks. The company drove to England, they brought all their equipment and they stayed in local accommodation and they were also able to enjoy the beautiful countryside in which they were touring. Yes, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. thanks uh, for, for, the, for that. And what about social aspects? How, what could you say about the rural touring and the social sustainability? Yeah, well, it was also very interesting hearing some of the speakers talk at the, uh, the plenary session, because um, the social and community aspects of our work is integral and central to the work that we do. So there are two key aspects of rural touring. One is the role of the local volunteer village promoter. And secondly, the fact that it's the, the village that chooses the show that they're going to present rather than be told what the show is going to be. Um, the local promoter is not a professional programmer and they live, in, they live in their local community and they know their local audience. And they'll often work with a group in the village to make the necessary arrangements to sell tickets and to host a company. Um, as I say, the village has a range of shows that they can choose from, and this element of choice results in a sense of local ownership around the staging of the performance and the desire for its success. The performance itself is a social event for the community as much as it is a cultural event. There's a lack of stigma for those who are less confident or intimidated by the thought of going to a theatre. They're more comfortable in the surrounds of a familiar village space, and the show is an opportunity to meet friends and neighbours and enjoy a convivial atmosphere. In the sparse evaluation, we also found that audience feedback was very strong in the fact that they felt very connected to each other. And it's very common for food and drink to play a part in the event. The intimacy created by the artist performing so close to the audience creates a real sense of cultural exchange. And, our, and, and artists experiencing experiencing this, love this connection. And I can't overestimate how unique and how important this is. Quite often the performer will maybe be only two or three meters from the first row of the performer from, of the audience. Rural promoter feedback conveys a great sense of pride in organizing a successful event. Um, they're memorable and they provide a talking point long after the show's over. Feedback also shows a sense of validation experienced by the village community, an appreciation that professional artists are willing and enthusiastic to travel and perform in their village hall. This all helps to bring, to build stronger social connections in village communities and also across a region where several rural promoters can meet and support each other. Although 40% of the European population lives in rural areas, something like 10% of available cultural investment is directed into rural areas. This imbalance in the distribution of resources for the arts impacts on the ongoing sustainability, visibility and accessibility of the arts in rural areas. I want to finish with two quotes, one from a Lithuanian promoter and one from a dance company. Um, the quote from the Lithuanian promoter, they said, my main task is to arrange the venue and to invite the audience. I always feel infinite responsibility and anxiety, but after all goes well, the stone rolls from my heart and I feel immense satisfaction. When Seiko Dance Theatre performed, people were so touched they even cried. It's a real joy to be able to show it to ordinary people and to see the viewer and the whole community grow together and to be united. And from the dance company, from an artist's perspective, Rural touring is a wonderful way to tour dance to new audiences who appreciate the work in a genuine and an unreserved way. What is the point in touring dance only for dance people? Rural touring opens up a new world of audiences 
and we are incredibly grateful and overwhelmed to have been offered this experience. So I'll put a couple of links to a couple of websites in the chat box as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. And thank all, thanks to all speakers. I hope it was dynamic and everyone got quite some inspiration about various topics relevant to Perform Europe. And I believe to all of us. And Catherine, here you are. Yeah. Thanks, Elena. Wow, everyone. I think it's so clear that there are so many considerations, reflections. Oh, don't put away Elena next to me. Keep her with me. I need to talk to her. <laughs> uh, studies uh, that were mentioned, thinking, uh, knowledge, questions that were put on the table. And I guess it's really high time now to put our heads together uh, in this little group, our breakout groups that we are going to have now and start discussing. But before that, it's time to say uh, goodbye to them, those ones that are following us on the live stream. It's not just a goodbye, but let me tell you that it was an impossible exercise, uh, an impossible exercise we had to do to bring the number of these now little breakout groups to down to 80 participants. And we tried, of course, in a hard exercise to consider the balance uh, in terms of sectors, presenters, producers, artists, countries, male, female, uh, I mean, live up to our own values, uh, backgrounds, interests, motivations that you put down and live up to our own values that we want to live and experience with Perform Europe. And since it was such an impossible exercise, we decided that we are going to repeat this workshop on the 18th of February. Um, yet, uh, the time is yet to be defined, but we are not uh, going to exclude, I hope, anybody who would like to contribute to this very first part uh, of our 18 months trajectory together. So. Having said that, we are now going to break out and we say goodbye to the live stream uh, audiences. Uh, we are going to break out now and we have around 50 minutes time to assemble uh, uh, each of us uh, in, in an exercise that was shared with you beforehand by email. Three wishes that we want to formulate uh, when it comes to our idea of how a performing arts touring fund should look like. So we really go now down to the ground. We, bring in our own professional backgrounds, our proposals that we can uh, bring from the field and, um, uh, and come back in plenary just before the ending to, uh, to conclude together. 